this morning's scripture reading will be from Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. I will be reading this from the New King James Version. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live. And may the law as the and may my law be the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman and the seductress who flatters with her words. Good morning. Really good to look out and see almost a full house. We've got a few little open places here, but that just means we've got to get to work and fill it up. But we're glad that those of you who are here are here. And those of you who are visiting, you're especially our honored guests. We invite you to come back and be with us. Uh, tonight we will meet at 5 o'clock. Wednesday nights we meet at 7. We'd love to have you be with us at any or all of those services. We are always open to your questions and comments should you have them. Our aim here is to simply teach the Word of God and without addition, subtraction, or substitution. And so sometimes that's bold preaching, and that's what you're going to get today. That's what you usually get from me. And uh, we're just trying to do what the Bible says. Now in our text that Brother Al read for us in Proverbs chapter 7, he warns us, Solomon, and he's writing uh, to a young person, but I think by implication to us as well as these scriptures are handed down over the centuries, he warns against the seductress, verse 5. He says in, in verses 1 through 4, just listen to me. Listen to what I've got to say. Listen to my advice. And verse 5, why? That they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, this kind of teaching is always needed, but everybody knows, if you, if you, unless you've been living under a rock, it seems like nearly every single day uh, we're inundated with one story after another about sexual harassment and misconduct. Now you'd have to be living under a rock and not be aware of that. We've been hearing that nearly every day. It's one person after another after another. It's singers, it's actors, it's directors, it's comedians, it's politicians, it's sports figures, on and on and on it goes. And headlines like that make this lesson especially appropriate for us today. We need to be talking about this we need to address the proper interaction of males and females. There's a proper way, there's a proper protocol here. And we need to be reminded of this from time to time. And so this lesson will be directed uh, toward this kind of thing. And as you can see, we've all heard the expression, the chickens have come home to roost. And that's the premise of my lesson. The sexual revolution, and for you young people, that's something that started about 50 years ago in case you're not aware of that. And we're, we're now reaping the fruits of the sexual revolution. The chickens have come home to roost, and you, you want to know why these things are going on, you can trace it back about 50 years when all this stuff started picking up and taking off, and now we're reaping the fruits of that. So let's talk about that this morning. I think we need to start at the obvious beginning, and that is this, sexual immorality is evil. That means it is wrong, that means it is sinful, that means it is not something that a Christian should be involved with. The term sexual immorality is a very, very broad term, and I just want to spend a few minutes explaining some of the things that fall under the umbrella of sexual immorality. First, let's talk about uh, sins involving sexual intercourse. We'll start with the word fornication. Fornication, according to the Greek scholars, is uh, sexual relation, or is, let, me, let me just back up a little bit, any kind, and this comes from, I think, Joseph Henry Thayer, any kind of illicit sexual intercourse. And so fornication is specific in that it refers to intercourse, but it is generic in that it refers to any kind of illicit sexual intercourse. Under the umbrella of fornication comes words like adultery. Adultery, 
uh, means that one of the persons involved, or maybe both of them, are married, but they're not married to the person they're having the relationship with. You see, they've gone outside the bounds of marriage, and they've brought somebody else into the relationship, and they've tainted it in that way. And so adultery is a specific form of fornication. Homosexuality is also fornication. Uh, Jude verse 7 talks about the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and describes it as fornication, but when you go back and read Genesis 19, you see that the specific fornication under consideration was homosexuality. Same thing would be true with lesbianism. Bestiality, which is, uh, in my mind, is just remarkable what such would even be discussed, but is actually addressed and discussed in the Old Testament. Bestiality, sexual relationships with animals, is, is also fornication. Rape, if you are, were to go out and forcibly uh, rape someone, the idea of forcing yourself on somebody, it's not, it's not consensual, but it's forced. That's fornication. Incest, uh, sexual relations within family. Uh, and there's an example of that even in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. He says, it's actually reported that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And so there you have the idea of incest, sexual relations within uh, a family group. And so these are the, the, uh, the sins of sexual immorality that are under the umbrella of fornication. But there's more. Sexual immorality comes outside of that, and it includes things such as lust. And by lust, I'm talking about desiring someone sexually that you have no business desiring. So we want to make sure we're spe very specific here. Pornography is sexual immorality. Uh, we ought not be looking at it. We ought not be buying those magazines. We ought not be looking at those television shows and those movies. We ought not be looking at it on the Internet. We ought to have nothing to do with it. You can get it uh, by magazine. You can get it by Internet. You can get it on television. But Christians ought to have nothing to do with that. And then, and this is kind of disgusting to me, but I don't know how else to say it, self-manipulation. I don't know how else to say that. That's sexual immorality, folks. That, that falls under the umbrella. And then, of course, there's what we hear in the headlines every day, sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is basically unwanted and inappropriate looks, touches, and remarks. Uh, those, those looks, touches, and remarks are of a sexual nature. And usually, especially when you get to the legal definition, it has to do, it has to do with somebody in a position of superiority over someone who is a subordinate. For example, a boss at work or a teacher at school. And how often have we seen lately of all the teachers being accused of sexual harassment? You see, they're in the power position and they take advantage of that position. And they go after young boys and young girls and they sexually harass them and commit sin with them. All of this is evil. I haven't even touched the scripture yet, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. I'm just introducing it right now just showing you the broad category of things that we're talking about. This is all evil, and yet it's all around us. We live in a world that's filled with this. We live in a world that glorifies this. We live in a world that says this is all right, and that's not true. I'm here to tell you it's not all right. It's not all right for anybody, and it's especially not all right for a Christian who ought to know better when we have access to a Bible telling us in no uncertain terms how evil this is. Let me ask you a question. Why is all this happening now? This gets back to my chickens come home to roost premise, doesn't it? Why is all this happening now? Why is it that every day there's another accusation? Every day there's another movie star, there's another politician, there's another singer, there's another sports figure. Why are we hearing that every day? Now the truth of the matter is these things have always happened. It's not new from that perspective, but it does seem to be on the upswing. And I would blame that on the so-called sexual revolution. Now, sometimes people glorify this. this as I said, this started about six, uh, 50 years ago, back in the 1960s. Ever heard of Woodstock? There's one of the watershed events that brought in the sexual revolution. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what we heard. And that was glorified. And that as though it were a good thing. And so the young people were in, and this was the hippie culture. The young people were involved in sexual immorality, such as we have described, in taking the illicit drugs, and in the rock and roll music that glorified that. Now, I'm not, this is not a sermon about rock and roll music, but there's no denying that some aspects of that music glorified this kind of behavior. 
From that arose what was called the free love movement. We ought to be allowed to be with whoever we want to be, whenever we want to be, and nobody ought to be able to say anything about it. If I want to be with this one, if I want to be with that one, if I want to be with another one, we ought to be allowed the free love movement. And then came the free condoms. Sometimes in some places, hopefully not here in Indiana, I don't know what the laws are here in Indiana, but in some places your kids can go right into a school and get those free condoms without you even knowing about it. Parents, there are some schools where that can actually happen. And they can get birth control and condoms and all sorts of things. And you know all that's going to do is encourage sexual immorality. They'll say, oh, it's for their protection. No, what it is is an encouragement to sexual immorality. You've heard me use that illustration before. Mama baking all those great, wonderful chocolate chip cookies. And she sets them all right in front of the child. And she says, that's for company. Do not eat those. But if you do, there's a napkin. Now, you know good and well what the child is going to do. And that's what we're doing when we're handing our kids condoms. That's exactly what, it's an encouragement to sexual immorality. And then there's sexually charged dancing and music. Now, I'm not the kind of preacher, and maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, I'm not the kind of preacher who thinks all dancing is sinful. I don't. I don't believe all dancing is sinful. But there is sexually charged dancing. There is lascivious dancing, and that is sinful. A Christian ought not be engaged in that kind of thing. Sexually charged dancing, sexually charged music, sexually charged clothing. You look at the way some of the clothing styles are advertised. Hot and sexy. It's no, there's no denying what they're advertising, folks. There's no denying what's being advertised. Sexual immorality is being advertised in the selling and the wearing of bathing suits and short shorts and miniskirts and halter tops and on and on and on I can go, you see. And again, you can trace all this back to the, again, sin has always been here, but you can trace the rise of this and the popularity of this all the way back about 50 years to the hippie movement of the 1960s. Fast forward to our day and now this stuff is easily accessible by the internet. The internet is a wonderful tool, but it also, as with many things, can be abused. And because of the ease of accessibility on the internet, you have access to all of this information, to all of the pornography, to all of this stuff. Cable television also makes it easily accessible. And people can have that piped right into their living rooms. They no longer have to sneak off to the X-rated theater. Now, and now I guess it's NC-17 is the new way. They used to call it X-rated in my day. But it's the same thing, it's filth. And now you don't have to sneak off to the X-rated theater. Now you can just have it piped right into your living room. And then on top of that, there's the open ridicule of you old-fashioned, puritanical, religious values. That's us, you see. Who are you people to tell us what to do? Who are you people to tell us how to live? And they ridicule and they make fun and they talk about how backwards we are and how uptight we are about sex and so forth and if you look you know Christians have children too okay and so it's not about being uptight it's about drawing a line between what's right and what's wrong that's what we have to understand here and then there is the acceptance of sexual immorality from high profile people now I'm gonna you might think I'm getting political here but I'm gonna be an equal opportunity offender okay so I'll bring in both sides Last October, November, we heard some ugly tapes, didn't we? Donald J. Trump saying some ugly things. And he says, that's just locker room talk. There is such a thing, by the way, but it's a despicable thing. There is a, any guy that's been in a locker room knows there's such a thing as locker room talk, but it's a despicable thing. It's not a good thing. It's a despicable thing. Men, Christian men especially, should not talk that way. But back up now about 20 years. William Jefferson Clinton committing adultery right in the Oval Office. And you know what we heard? That's his private life. That has, that's none of our business. That's his private life. Now I'm saying all that to say this. Why is this happening now? Really? Do we need to ask? Do we need to ask why this is all happening now? 
why all this stuff is coming out now, why all these people are coming out of the world. Do we have to ask? Let me, let me just give you a scripture here. Take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 6. In verses 7 and 8, and this will answer the question for us. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We as a society, and when I say that, I don't necessarily mean you and I. Hopefully as Christians, we're not dabbling in this stuff. And so I want to make sure that I'm clear, but we as a society are simply reaping what we've sown for the last 50 years. We've sown to the wind, and now we're reaping the whirlwind. We have nobody to blame but ourselves. Look into the mirror, because whenever you indulge in any of this stuff, you're saying it's okay, and you're inviting others to do it by your example, by your influence. And so we're simply reaping what we've sown. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. It's going to get a whole lot worse unless people get back to this book. Less than until people get back to this book, it's going to get a whole lot worse. And in just two words there, societal deterioration. That's what we're talking about. That's what I've tried to outline for you. And we defend it. And I don't, again, hopefully not us as Christians, but society defends it. Well, that's my favorite singer, and so it's okay if he leaves his wife for another woman. That's a football player that makes a lot of money. It's okay if he beats his wife. That's all right, because he makes a lot of money. And you see what we've done? We're justifying all this. Well, that's my favorite politician. He's in my political party, and so that's all right. But this other guy, you know, you see how that gets to be a little one-sided? And so we're reaping what we've sown. Now let's open our Bibles up. The scriptures have got a lot to say about this. And I'm just going to scratch the hem of the garment this morning, but we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures here. Let's start off with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is laying down principles for the kingdom of heaven, living under the law and yet laying down principles for the kingdom. So it's a twofer, you might say. He's addressing the Jews, but he's addressing us as well. And in Matthew 5 and verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth. He's talking about disciples. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are to be salt and we are to be light. In a word, that means we're to be influential in a good way, in a positive way. Not letting our darkness show, but our light show. Making sure that we're seasoning the world, that we're being that proper influence upon the world. Not only that, but dropping down to about verse 27, we see that we're to avoid both lust and adultery. Jesus talks about nipping sin in the bud here. He says, verse 27, You've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know what he's saying? Nip it in the bud. Stop this before it gets started. Don't even start down the path. Don't even look her way. That's what Solomon said, by the way, in Proverbs 7. Don't, don't even look at her. Don't go down her way. Don't pass by her, her way that she travels. Just stay away. Nip this thing in the bud. And Jesus goes on to explain, verse 29 and following, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. It's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Do what you have to do to stop this immorality. Jesus uses radical language. Cut off your hand, pluck out your eye. But the point is, do what you got to do. If you got to rip that TV out, rip it out, if that's your problem. If you got to throw that laptop away, throw it away, if that's your problem. If you can't stop looking at the stuff, if you can't stop accessing the stuff, you do what you got to do to deal with it. Pluck out your eye, cut off your hand is the idea. And then he goes on to say, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her 
to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Avoiding lust, avoiding adultery, nipping it in the bud, being salt, being light. And we're just getting started. In Romans chapter 12, Paul now in these, in these verses, starting in Romans 12, getting down to the nitty-gritty of everyday Christian living. We're studying the book of Romans on Wednesday nights right now. And the first 11 chapters deal with the theory, if you please, behind salvation. Starting in chapter 12, he gets down to the nitty-gritty of our daily life. How does all this come home to me in my daily life? And he says in verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you've been raised up in a world like this, you've got a lot of mind renewing to do. You've got a lot of thinking to change. Because you've been raised up in a world uh, of immorality and you think that's normal and you think that's the right It's not normal and it's not the right way. And so you've got some mind renewing to do. You've got some thinking to change here because he says we've got to give ourselves to God as a sacrifice. And we can't be conformed to this world. We can't do what everybody else is doing and we can't defend what everybody else is defending and we can't live the way everybody else is living. Unacceptable. Moving on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul, in, in an entire section here in the sixth chapter, addresses fornication. It was a pre particularly appropriate in, the, in this culture because the Corinthian culture had a, a temple there that was dedicated, I think it was the goddess Aphrodite, if memory serves correctly, but there was a thousand sacred prostitutes, sacred prostitutes, and I put that in quotation, in the temple. And to worship, you would go into the temple there and you would commit ritual fornication with those temple prostitutes. And so some of the Corinthians coming out of that culture were kind of being tempted to go back into that culture. And Paul is saying, uh-uh, can't live that way as Christians. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality, literally fornication. Run away from it. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits fornication sins against his own body. Your body was not designed for this. There's not to be any hint of immorality in your life. You're to be salt. You're to be light. You're not to lust. You're not to commit adultery. You're to flee fornication. Moving on here, out here to chapter 7. How do I run away from fornication? Verses 1 and 2. Concerning the things of which I wrote to you, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Keep him in context. He just said flee fornication. And so not to touch a woman intimately in that way. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, and if I can insert a word, the danger of, the old King James says, to avoid fornication. To avoid fornication. Let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. You see, there's a way to satisfy sexual desire without sin. And with a Christian, there's to be no hint of immorality. Every man is to have his own wife, and every woman is to have her own husband, and no one else. And no one else's wife, and no one else's husband. Move on out here to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And here's where it really gets home. Last week we talked about some of these things too. We talked about how marriage can be messy. We talked about the temptation to adultery. And I made the point last week, no one is immune. And that brings us to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We can sit here and pontificate about these things, but if we're not keenly aware that it could happen to me, that it could happen to any one of us, then we're on dangerous ground. Let every man, he says, take heed lest he fall. Be very, very careful how you behave, how you act, how you talk, how you interact with those of the opposite sex. Moving on out to Ephesians chapter 5. This is a great text right here. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. There's your sexual harassment right there wrapped up in three verses. Right there. Right there it is, folks. 
And look at this. He starts off with fornication. The uncleanness here, he's talking about moral uncleanness. He's not talking about people who don't take a bath. That's bad too. But he's talking here about moral uncleanness. And then covetousness. Now look at this context. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Can I suggest to you that the specific kind of covetousness he's talking about here is coveting illicit sexual relations? I think it fits the context very well. And then get this, verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, the filthiness. That's obscenity. That's what he's talking about, obscenity. And people making obscene remarks toward one another. This is your sexual harassment right here. The obscene remarks, the foolish talking, the foolish things that are said. Coarse jesting, another word for that is just dirty jokes. Lewd humor, sinful humor. He says, none of that. It's not fitting. Instead of doing all that, why don't you get on your knees and thank God for your blessings? And then he warns us. You engage in this kind of thing, and you're not going to have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. You're not going to heaven, folks, if you live this way. Christian or not, you live like this, you're not going to heaven. What we're saying here is no hint of immorality. None of it. Not even a smidgen of it. None. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 22. Abstain from every form of evil. The old King James kind of misses the boat there. It says appearance. He's not talking about things that just look evil. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about evil in its manifestations. Every form, every kind of evil. And that includes this kind of evil. Stay away from it. Have nothing to do with it. Uh, don't endorse it. Don't encourage it. Don't participate in it. Stay clear away from it. And then, here's some good passages. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen to these verses. He's talking here about our inner... Here we are in a congregation interacting. We have men and women here. And, and he's talking about our interactions here. Verse 1, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers. He's talking about respect here. Just simple respect. Get this, verse 2, Men, pay attention. The older women as mothers. The younger as sisters. With all purity. It's not treat the younger women as your girlfriend. It's not treat the younger women as your wife. Treat them as sisters. Treat the older women as mothers. Show a little respect. Hands off. Watch what you say. Watch how you behave. You see what's, what he's saying here? That's exactly what he's talking about. This drives at the very heart of the whole sexual harassment thing. Mind your P's and Q's. Keep your hands to yourself and watch what you say. That's what he's saying in these verses. And then in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that's what we've been preaching about for the last 25 minutes, or however long I've been talking, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Stay away from this. In the Christian's life, there is to be no hint of immorality. Let it not even be named among you. That's what he's driving at here. And look at all the scriptures we've looked at here. And I just barely scratched the surface, folks. If I wanted to, I could produce a whole lot more. There's a lot of scriptures that address this. The Bible has a lot to say about this. And all we've done here is just scratch the surface, but we've scratched it in such a way that it is very clear and unambiguous that Christians should have no hint of immorality, especially sexual immorality as in the context of our lesson here, no hint of sexual immorality in their lives whatsoever. Now, I got one final point to make here. Some closing reminders. I think this is important. Sometimes, listen carefully, because I don't want to be misunderstood. Sometimes there's a political agenda at work in some of this stuff. How do I know that? Well, isn't it interesting that sometimes nobody says a word until about a month before an election, and out it comes. Now, that doesn't mean that what they did was okay. You see what I'm driving at? That's why I said listen carefully. Doesn't mean what they did was okay, but it does show that there's another agenda here, that there's a political agenda. And sometimes in politics, politics is ugly business. 
Politics is dirty business. And sometimes people lie. We have to understand that. Now, we can bring that into our own lives. So let me start off first of all. We've already said this is sinful. Please understand that. This is sinful. So we're not defending it at all. But sometimes people make accusations that simply are not true. An accusation is not proof. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 7. And by the way, this is not just in the political realm. This is in, the, in our daily realm, our daily lives as well. An accusation is not proof. In John 7 and verse 24, if I ever get my Bible turned to the right page, Jesus said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Understand what's being said there. Well, that looks awful bad. Well, that looks bad. Well, it may look bad, but is it bad? That's what Jesus is getting at. It looks bad, Jesus. You healed that man on the Sabbath day. That looks real bad. But was it bad? Of course not. The Son of God can heal anytime He wants to. Think about the principle. Things might look bad. Things might sound bad. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Drop down to verse 51. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? Let's get the facts. Let's understand. And this is just across the board. That's just, that's just something to be reminded of. We live in a hostile environment. We need to be very careful here. Accusation is not proof. Let's make sure we know what we're talking about. And here's a, here's a shock. I know this will be a shocker for you. But accusers can and sometimes do lie. Yes, they do. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 39. While you're turning there, I'll, years ago I read a sermon outline. It was on lying. And the preacher made an interesting observation in his outline. There's only two kinds of liars in this world, men and women. <laughs> the reason I say that is we're hearing a lot in the news media. You have to believe the accusers. Oh, you just have to believe. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Accusation is not proof. Remember Potiphar's wife? In Genesis 39, we read this last week. Remember she's after Joseph, verse 7. It came to pass after these things, his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and he said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what's with me in the house. He's committed all that he has to my hand. There's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you're his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? In modern parlance, you see, is sexually harassing him. That's exactly what she's doing. In fact, verse 10, So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. That's the definition of harassment. Harassment is ongoing over and over and over. And she's after him. And it says there, He did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside she caught him by his garment and said lie with me but he ran or excuse me left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called the men of her house and she spoke to them and saying see he's brought to us a Hebrew to mock us he came into me to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice she lied it was the other way around wasn't it accusers sometimes lie and that's why I say, as a closing reminder, just understand, because we're living in a very, very dangerous environment. Accusation is not proof. Joseph went to jail over this false accusation. Surely, we can see the travesty of justice that's done there. So as we wrap all this up, we're living in dangerous times, but here's the problem. We've let the genie of sexual immorality out of the bottle. And now we're reaping the fruits. And we know how that expression goes. Let the genie out of the bottle. Pandora's box. You can't put it back in. You can't put it back in. Now, as I say all that, I say this. We do not defend this trashy conduct. I do not, and nobody that I know in this congregation defends this kind of trashy conduct. But we need to be very, very careful not to overreact to what's going on in the world out there. Because here's the bottom line as, I, as I'm getting at this. Not every man out there is a stalker. That's the way it's painted sometimes in the media. 
Not every man is a stalker. Not every inappropriate remark is sexual harassment. We need to get back to the Bible. Bible things in Bible ways, Bible things by Bible names, and Christians act with integrity in every situation. Watch what you do, watch what you say, watch how you interact, do not cross any lines, be a person of integrity. Hope the lesson has been of some benefit to you. I think it was very appropriate for the times that we're living in. I think it serves as a reminder to us. I haven't told you anything new. I haven't told you anything you don't already know, but just something to remind us about the seriousness of God's Word. One of these days, Jesus is going to come back and we're going to stand before Him in judgment. And if we have sins that have not been forgiven, we're going to lose our eternal souls. What we're talking about today and every day when we hit this pulpit, we're talking about things that matter for all eternity. We're not just talking about things that matter today or tomorrow. We're talking about things that matter for all eternity. So if you're out there lost in sin, we hope that you will reconsider the life you're living, that you'll come to Jesus this very day, that you'll put your faith in him. Don't put your faith in me. Don't put your faith in the congregation. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. He will never let you down. Turn from your sins. Confess your faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let one of us take you into this tank of water behind me and baptize you for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter said that very thing. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you've done that, but have strayed away, come back. The Lord still, he'll, he'll, he's looking for you. He's wanting you to come back. Come back, confess your sins, pray that he'll forgive you. We can pray with you and for you, but come right now while we stand and while we sing.